don't want to assume with you, Dave. First uh, Samuel twenty four. First Samuel twenty four. First Samuel chapter twenty four. And these are the words of the Lord. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that I was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David, David seekest, seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but mine eye spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. As saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. And it came to pass, when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And thou hast showed this day how that thou hast dealt well with me for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand thou killest me not for if a man find his enemy will he let him well go away go well away wherefore the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day and now behold I know well that thou shalt surely be king and the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand swear now therefore unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David sware unto Saul, and Saul went home, but David and his men got them up unto the hold. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let's pray once more. Father, we do not deserve your word. It is a gift to us. 
sometimes more difficult for us to understand, more things to unpack, more layers, more pieces to, to put together and, and to fit together correctly. And we pray that you'd help us to do that tonight. Pray that the teaching of your word would be in line with what is true from your word, that you'd bless it unto us. Guide us by your spirit, me in teaching, all of us in, in hearing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Saul continues his hunt for David, a hunt that has been and will continue to be unsuccessful. We know the reason from that, for that from chapter 23. That's because David is the Lord's anointed, and God had not given David into Saul's hand, so it wasn't going to happen. Because of this, Saul has been striving in vain, chapter after chapter. Tables turn here in chapter 24, and David has an opportunity as the hunter. David is given an opportunity as the hunter. And what does he do with this opportunity? What has happened previously that is influencing his decision? What does it mean for Saul to be the Lord's anointed at this point in his reign? With everything he's done. What does David owe to such a tyrant? What do we ever owe to a tyrant who has forsaken God's law, broken his covenant before God, and abandoned his covenant with the people he governs? And if we can depose tyrants, if that is the case, then what is David doing? What is David doing? Are David's circumstances unique? And if so, then how are they unique? We also have another instance of a ripping of a robe. This isn't the first one we've had in Samuel. We had it back in 1 Samuel 15. The first time symbolizes the loss of a kingdom. Saul grabbing after Samuel's robe as he departed from him. And this second time, it winds up being a symbol of who would have the throne. Saul would be stripped and David would be established. And one of the key takeaways from this chapter is that the way this was going to happen would be in accordance with God's timing. The way this would happen would be in accordance with God's timing. Just because we know the ending doesn't necessarily mean we can do anything we want to get there. Verse 1, And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Enjedi. So Saul is chasing the Philistines around Israel, interestingly not fighting with him in the text, chasing them around, following them. And he gets intel on David's newest location in Enjedi. With the Philistines no longer posing a threat to Saul, that they were previously, Saul decides to run right back to David. Right? He had him almost in his hands in the last chapter, runs off to the Philistines, chases them off, here's where David is, and goes right back to work. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So Saul brings chosen warriors to find and to fight against David. The slated battle would be David and his 600 against Saul and his 3,000 chosen men. Saul's got five to one odds. He's feeling good. Saul is again seen to be rather frantic, right? He's running all over the kingdom, trying to get a handle on everything. He almost had David. He gets distracted by the Philistines, and now he's back on the scent. Obviously, David still has plenty of people to win over if he was going to be king, right? If David was going to inherit this kingdom, if he was going to inherit the throne, and he had a lot of people to, to win over. Remember last week, you have the Keolites, and the Ziphites, at one point or another, snitching on him to Saul. And now you have somebody who knew of his whereabouts in Enjedi and made sure that Saul knew about it. So he still doesn't have the people on his side. He's got his 600 men, and that's probably it. The land is full of men who are faithful to Saul. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And obviously this was a big cave because we've got activities happening in there, conversations happening, and Saul's unaware that any of it's happening. So, Or Saul was just really loud with whatever he was doing. But David is hiding with his men in the cave as Saul and his host pass by. Right? They're hiding in this cave, just hoping they're going to pass by, I'm assuming. And Saul winds up ducking into that very same cave, circumstantially. Saul went in to relieve himself in the cave, covering his feet as a euphemism for going potty. 
So he goes in to go potty. And it's interesting, the only other, I'm, there might be other instances of it, but another instance of this in the Bible is with uh, Ehud and Eglon. Right? Eglon is a Moabite king who's ruling over the Israelites. He's not ruling in Moab only. He's ruling over the Israelites. And when Ehud goes in and kills him, uh, locks the doors, gets out of there, and all of uh, Eglon's men think that he's in there covering his feet, relieving himself, so they're not going to go disturb him. They waited until they waited until it was just an embarrassingly long amount of time. Like, listen, nobody should be in there for that long. Something's wrong. He needs our help. We've all been there. So Saul goes into this cave, a tyrant in his own right. Which is why I think it's an interesting, interesting that we have that phrase in both of those instances. Right, we have a tyrant who was killed. Now we have a tyrant, and David's men really think this is a, a one-to-one parallel. It's game time. All right, so Saul goes into this cave, a tyrant in his own right, and he makes himself vulnerable in the presence of his enemies. A time of great relief for Saul was actually a time of eminent danger. You just never know. Not in a cave, anyway. Verse 4. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand. And thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Do your thing, David. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. Whether David's men were quoting something to him or making something up that sounded valiant, they were operating off of the fact that they believed that David would one day have the throne. They believed David would one day have the throne. Here's Saul, the one on the throne now and not doing a very good job. Like, put the pieces together and you have your solution. <laughs> nice. Thank you. I tried to make all the connections I could and you just bound to miss some. Yeah. <laughs> well done. You know, put these pieces together and you have a solution, right? David's to inherit the throne. Here's the guy on the throne right now. <laughs> the throne. Obviously, God had handed Saul over to David on a silver platter. It wasn't a head-to-head -head battle with Saul surrounded by his 3,000 warriors, right? They didn't meet in a plain, 3,000 against 600, and have to battle it out. Saul is, by himself, very vulnerable. All of his warriors out in the field, past beyond, probably somebody guarding the, the door to the cave. And so David did arise. But we read that he arises and only cuts off a piece of Saul's robe. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. <laughs> Gotta love the King James. The means were there for an end that David knew was part of God's plan. He knew the end, which was a part of God's plan, him having the throne. David was going to receive the throne. He had been anointed for the throne. And David receiving the throne meant Saul would no longer have it. Only one of them would have it. If David killed Saul, Saul would no longer have it. And therefore, he could take the throne. David's men saw this clearly. That's why they implored David the way they did. But God did not bless those means. Even though the end seemed to line up with God's plan, it was, I think, not the way God said it would happen. And therefore, David was convicted. Because of this, and I'll explain more momentarily, David sees even his action of cutting off a piece of Saul's skirt, his robe, as sin. The robe represented the throne, and David was not to take the throne like this. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the, Lord, the anointed of the Lord. Now, some would look at this instance of temptation for David and say that the temptation was to despise one God had appointed as an authority instead of giving him respect. Right, that's how some people are going to explain that passage. You know, a la Romans 13, this is a ruler. Rulers are established by God. Therefore, you need to obey. Period. Saul was the Lord's anointed, David's master, and so David was disobeying what, what is later set forth in Romans 13 in regards to obeying his ruler. But here's part of the problem with that line of reasoning. Every leader is established by God, appointed by him, ordained by him. Every leader. 
All leaders are appointed by God to protect those who do good, to reward them, and to punish those who do evil. And every leader is worthy of honor and respect and obedience so long as they do that. So long as they do that. Continue in that train. So long as leaders punish evil and protect goodness in accordance with the law of God, they are to be obeyed, and it is sin to do otherwise. It is sin to disobey a ruler appointed by God, carrying out his office in the way God commands him to carry out his office. Rulers have a covenant with the people they rule over and a covenant with God. And when they break those covenants, they become illegitimate rulers. What were the Israelites following Saul supposed to do when he told them to go and slaughter the priests in Nob? Were they, before God, supposed to honor the Lord's anointed? No. They should have said no. Saul had broken covenant with God and broken covenant with the people of Israel. And he had not turned to them in repentance. Right? David, already David hasn't been a perfect ruler. Even in this chapter, we have an example of his repentance. Saul had not come in repentance to the people. He had not come in repentance to the Lord. He is killing the Lord's priests. He is leaving cities like Keilah to face the Philistines alone. And he is hunting down the Lord's anointed. That's who Saul is. Saul, called the anointed of the Lord, no longer had the spirit of the Lord. Right? And it departed from him. He had departed from Saul a while back. And Saul hadn't heard from God since. Saul was a tyrant. Saul stood opposed to God's law and God's people. He had made himself their enemy. Saul's status as a tyrant, in and of itself, makes him an illegitimate ruler. Saul, in and of himself, is not worthy of receiving obedience from those he ruled over. Part of the reason we know this is because we look back, think back to Eglon and Ehud. Ehud is a hero in the Bible. He's a hero for what he did to Eglon. And that is because he killed a tyrant in Eglon who was ruling over the people of Israel. Saul was clearly an enemy of the people. Clearly an enemy of the people. And if his actions had not already set him up as a tyrant, what would it take? As it stood, there weren't any more priests to kill. Right? You think about one of the most profane things to do to the Israelites, kill the priests. We'd already done that. What more do you want him to do to establish himself as a tyrant in the land? Saul was a tyrant, and tyrants need to be deposed. So why couldn't David kill the Lord's anointed? the one the Lord had established for this season over Israel? I think the answer is that David received a word from the Lord as to how he was to ascend to the throne, whether specifically or vaguely. And though tempted to do otherwise, David was fixed on obeying God. Though tempted to do otherwise, David was fixed on obedience to God. And so he does not stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed. David wanted to have the throne in God's timing in no other way. Not that he wasn't tempted elsewhere, but he wanted the throne in God's timing in no other way. I don't think Saul deserved to rule over Israel, and I don't think it was outlandish to want to see Saul deposed. That seems very reasonable for a zealous Israelite to want a man like that out of his seat. Very reasonable. The spirit had departed from this man, and he was therefore not walking with the Lord. I think David probably received this word from Samuel in chapter 19 when they are in Ramah. The two of them have a meeting together in Ramah prior to Saul arriving into town. We don't ever hear the content of that meeting, but David's actions following that meeting fall in line with this idea that Samuel told David how God planned to bring him to the throne. Or minimally, how he was not to ascend to the throne. Not through cutting down Saul himself. Something of that effect. Also, looking ahead to 1 Samuel 26, 1 Samuel 26, verses 9 and 10, this is David's interaction with Abishai when he wants to put forth his hand against Saul. And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth thine hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. The Lord shall smite him, and his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish, which is exactly what happens. 
David certainly seems to have some very clear information as to Saul's end. God would take care of Saul. Where did he learn this information if it was not revelation from God? Was it a lucky guess or had Samuel told David that God would end Saul's reign in his timing and that David was to be patient? One way or another, it seems like David obtained that type of information and was waiting on the Lord to see his path to the throne established. I think this makes the most sense of why this tyrant is able to continue to rule in the land. God had told David that he would have the throne when God gave it to him, and it was David's duty to wait on God. David was in sin, not because it would have been wrong to go after such a tyrant in such a position in normal circumstances, but because God had told David or minimally given him a strong inclination that he was to inherit the throne another way. And why such an end? Why such an end for Saul? Why was Saul to be spared and preserved? Well, with the will of God, it's impossible to ever thoroughly explain all that is accomplished in his timing of things. And this goes for all of our lives, right? Every little thing. There is David's trust in God that is bolstered through the process. There is judgment stored up for those with Saul. There is sanctification for all those following David and tons of other things. God's wisdom is great. David killing Saul would send the kingdom into an upheaval at this point, would it not? Think about how all these, every, every town they go to, it seems like David's running into more friends of Saul. And so there's wisdom in not killing Saul, part of God's plan. David had all of his supporters with him. About 600 men at this point, so it was very, he was very likely aware of this fact. It's not like he had support of the populace. If he killed Saul, what would be the result? Would he automatically have the support of the majority? Or would there be a deep divide in Israel? Probably a deep divide. And God's plan was for David's throne to be established in righteousness over the whole land. And part of this meant trusting God's timing for the whole thing. Because of the word of the Lord to David... Saul was to be his master until God said otherwise. And more ultimately, the purpose of this whole picture, more ultimately, was that David was to serve as a type of Christ in the way he inherited his throne, suffering unto glory. Just like our Lord, suffering unto glory. The words of verse 6 come as a rebuke to David's men, who had tempted him greatly to undermine God's plan with his own or with their own. And how tempting it can be to see a good end and pursue it by wicked means. See a good end and pursue it by wicked means. Frustration with God's timing. Right? We see this, we see this in the church, and you see it all over our nation. Frustration with God's timing on having children has led many to artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, and the like. But checking the box of having children, very good thing. God loves that. God loves us having children. Checking that box is not necessarily righteous. God has given lawful means. And so having children while producing a bunch of little babies who die in a Petri dish is not glorifying to God. It's an ungodly means to that end. Right? Having to go outside of what is lawful sex and marriage to produce children is not honoring to God. It's not honoring to God. Better to be barren And to call on God continually, to wait on his timing as you walk in his prescribed means, than to forsake his way and pursue what you say is God's desired end. If it's God's desired end for you, then he'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. So pursue it by his means. Honor him in the whole process. A woman keeping a tidy home in such a way that the home isn't allowed to be used for living. What good is that? Tidy home is good. Clean home is a great thing. But it isn't to be suited at the cost of everything else God has called us to do in our homes. Like cook lots of food, make lots of dirty dishes, and let people have fun. Let kids run around and make a mess. You could have well-behaved kids who don't know how to laugh and have fun and be adventurous. Because it's harder to do both. It's harder to have the end you want and pursue it by godly means. Providing for your family is good, but only the right way. Only the right way. Only through lawful means. Get your money by cheating someone else 
or through a job that is in and of itself contrary to what God delights in, and you've sinned against God, God doesn't delight in that. The clean house isn't ultimate. Well-behaved kids is not ultimate. Money in the bank is not ultimate. We can pursue many good things the wrong way. We can forsake what God calls us to in the name of obedience. God wants our obedience. He wants us to pursue the things he says are good and beautiful and to pursue it in his way. And when we have a clear word from God on how something is to be pursued, then that is the only way we can pursue that thing. Pretty straightforward. And when things don't come in the timing you want, you should evaluate your life and trust God. I say evaluate your life because God delights to bless us. And so sometimes sin is keeping us from a blessing. So the first thing to do is evaluate your life. Is there sin? That's a legitimate question, right? The fact that there's not the blessing you want from God doesn't mean necessarily there's sin, but there could be. And so start there. Is there sin? And from there, trust God. From there, trust God. David was tempted to reach the end he knew was coming, to reach the end that he knew was coming by another route. He gave in a little, and he took a taste of the rope. Right? It's like Adam in the garden, who likewise failed by eating of the tree that God had forbidden him from eating. God had set a pattern of giving seasons of testing. Endure the testing period. Endure that testing period and receive the reward. And it's similar to Jesus, who, unlike these men, unlike these men, resisted the devil's temptation to receive power over the kingdoms of the earth by a means other than death and resurrection. And Jesus' resistance of the devil, his obedience to the will of the Father, is why we have forgiveness and life. And thinking also about, you know, application of this idea, so we don't have a, so Ehud is a good example, right? Ehud is a good example. And David is an example of a tyrant ruling in the land who is not to be slain. A tyrant ruling in the land who is not to be slain. And so when we think about tyrants being in the land, you know, how should we think about that? How should we process that? Do we have tyrants in the land? First question. Obviously we do. Obviously we do. And the primary ministry we do as a church together is going out to Planned Parenthood. And so we're just keenly aware, which I think is a really good thing, right? People can get caught up in, you know, being just kind of cliche Christians. Oh, of course you guys are at Planned Parenthood. That's such a, you know, why don't you go do something unique? I don't really care for doing anything unique. I'd rather be remembered as a church that was at the doors of Planned Parenthood when there's babies being slaughtered in the land. I think that's right where we're supposed to be. So it's a good thing. And we're, we're right at the gates of Planned Parenthood, so we know that children are slaughtered in our land. And I don't think we have an ethical divide between what you should do when you see a murder in the middle of the street and when there's a murder happening behind pretty glass doors. I don't think there's a huge ethical dilemma as to what's supposed to take place there. And so I think one of the ways we should be thinking about uh, evil men in our land, tyrants in our land, is... Similar to, you know, think about, if you look at just the strategy side, apart from any kind of revelation David had from God, you think about the strategy side of what was going to come about if David took the throne by force in that moment. If he took the throne uh, by killing Saul in the cave. And those 3,000 men might want to just try to wipe them out right there. And he's going to probably have more and more hurdles to go over. If we take an action at Planned Parenthood, this tribe, how much is accomplished? And how much ought to be accomplished? How much needs to be accomplished? How much can we do? I think that's more of the question we should be asking. I don't think we're in a season of saying, oh, that's, you know, we're, we're David. We're David in the sense that uh, we ought to obey God. We ought to obey God. We ought to have zeal for his name and take that zeal and apply it to what's happening in our land. And we ought to be wise in the way that we do that. And so, similar to what a lot of you guys are going to say, I think with, you guys know what I'm talking about, so with a slightly different end in certain categories, we ought to be doing uh, exactly what we're striving to do, which is build up families, build up sons, make connections in this community, start businesses, be independent, 
be able to sustain ourselves and raise up sons and more and more, right? Not staying in our own little world, our own microcosm, but building connections and actually developing a people who fear the Lord. We need a people who fear the Lord. I think that's what's going to affect change in our land is a people who fear the Lord. And so that starts in our homes, but then we need to be thinking outward. We've had, we had a great meeting this week, even with a, a brother who's been out of Planned Parenthood. And hopefully we can, you know, develop a body of men and a body of women who are willing uh, to push the envelope, create legislation, build a movement of people who fear the Lord. And so we should pray to that end and seek to establish that with an end of deposing the tyrants. That's the end in mind. But thinking about feasibility, thinking about how we accomplish that, trying to be wise. And so we should be praying to that end that God would raise up those people, that he'd give us wisdom in the meantime of how to accomplish that, how to go about that work. But our eye is towards deposing the tyrants. We preach the gospel, and the gospel is going to affect things in this community. We need to believe that. The gospel will affect things in this community. It will affect hearts. And eventually, the law of God, as the gospel takes more and more hearts, the law of God will reign in the land. And that will be a glorious thing. I really like it here. I'd like it a lot more if kids weren't getting killed every day. That'd be great. But we need a fear of the Lord. We need a preaching of the word of God, a fear of the Lord, and obedience to him. So David stayed his servants with these words. Right, his rebuke held them off from themselves killing Saul. And suffered them not to rise against Saul, but Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David's harsh, harsh rebuke to his men leads, Saul, leads to Saul walking out of the cave without any harm to his own person. And David starts his repentance by confronting his tempters, right? Rebuking them and informing them that it was not their place or David's to attack Saul. Saul leaves oblivious of the piece of his robe missing, left his throne behind, and oblivious to all the conversations that were taking place in the cave around him. That part just boggles my mind. Very loud whispers, I guess. David also arose afterwards and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. Now notice David's repentance. He's a humble man. He leaves the safety of the cave. He comes before Saul in humility. He calls Saul Lord, for God had continued to give Saul such an office over David. And he bows himself down in front of him. David has a confidence in God delivering him from his foes. That's David's confidence. And there's a willingness to put himself out there, to put himself at risk, just to square things up with Saul. Right? What else does he gain from this interaction? But reconciling with Saul, squaring things up with him. He would not try to hide his sins or make excuses for them, like Saul has done throughout the previous chapters. But he owned it, and he apologized for it. And so... Own your sin straight up. Own your sin straight up. Even when there are consequences or risks of consequences for doing so, take responsibility. Love God. Hate your disobedience to him. Hate that about yourself. That you continue to do that. Continue to disobey God. Why do we do that? He's so good to us. And confess your sins. God delights in true repentance. So own your sin and testify to the glory of the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what we testify to in our repentance. We're washed in the blood of the Son of God. Your relationships are meant to be full and not shallow. Conceal sin, right? Build relationships with one another, concealing sin that is present in those relationships. And those relationships will only be surface level. That's all you're allowing them to be. They can't grow beyond that. Confessing sin will mean deeper relationships in the long run. The short term may be rough because sin can bring real difficulties, real lack of trust, 
And that's not sin in response. That's not a sin in response to your sin of somebody saying they don't trust you as much. Oh, now you're sinning against me by saying you don't trust me, and now I feel bad. Now you just sinned in such a way that somebody can't trust you because you have to earn trust. So that's actually a pretty reasonable response sometimes. And so that will be difficult. That's just the fruit of sin. But the truth is better than falsehood. The truth is better than falsehood. Concealment will keep things shallow in the immediate and then in the long run bring destruction. So shallow in the immediate, you can't get deeper because you're concealing sin. And eventually division, eventually destruction because sin brings forth death. That's all it's good for. And also confess your sins because uh, facing the consequences and the embarrassment of sin is a good thing. It's a good thing to do. Better to own the consequences now than to conceal the thing. And being embarrassed by your sins is actually a great motivator to stop acting like that. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how the the Lord had delivered thee today into my hand in the cave. And some bade me kill thee, but mine eye spared thee. And I I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, see, yea, the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee. Yet thou huntest my soul to take it. So David first asks Saul why he's believing the lies that he's hearing about David seeking to cause him harm. It's not true. So David says, why are you believing that? What have I done in the past to make you think I would act in this way? How have I treated you wrongly, even once? David had not sinned against Saul, and yet Saul was treating David as, as if he had completely betrayed him and sought to kill him. As if Saul was acting in response to something David said, something David did. David has proof positive that this is not his aim. That's not his goal. And that proof is the fact that God had delivered Saul into David's very cave. Leaving him completely at the mercy of David. I'll get you. David does not take the opportunity. The opportunity is presented to him. And he does not, he does not give in to his own temptation, to those urging him on to that end, to kill Saul. David refuses to take the throne apart from God giving it to him. Further proof is that this is that this is how it went down. Further proof of this being the truth is that David had a piece of Saul's robe in his hand. If he wanted to do it, he could have done it. He took a piece of his robe. He was right there. Right there. And David implores Saul to recognize the dynamic at play. Recognize the dynamic at play. Saul had counted David as his greatest enemy, and he'd been spending himself hunting for David. But David has a very easy opportunity to kill Saul. A very easy opportunity, and he only cut off a piece of his robe. He did not harm his flesh. Why, David asks Saul, does he continue to try and take David's soul? Why was he so paranoid? Why was he so full of malice? And a big part of the answer to those questions from David is answered by the lack of the Spirit of God in Saul's life. David's taking him a corner of the robe was also symbolic, as I mentioned earlier. The robe represented the throne, and Saul, in 1 Samuel 15, had ripped Samuel's robe, which we see was symbolic of Saul losing the kingdom. And that's off right after he refused to completely wipe out the Amalekites, right? He's got his oxen. The text really says that, you know, Samuel's approaching, he hears the, the sheep and the oxen. It's just a really awkward moment for Saul. Just hearing animals making their animal noises in the background. It's like pretty obvious they didn't do what he needed to do here. Samuel goes to depart from him. And we see the spirit of the Lord also departs from Saul. And Saul, you know, reaches for his robe, rips off a piece, right? He's, he's trying to cling to it. But it's fleeing from him. It's gone. Saul grabbed after the robe in desperation as Samuel departed from him. 
after his refusal to obey God and his refusal to own his sin. For David, the one who would eventually ascend to the throne, he almost takes a similarly desperate approach. But David repents. He turns from this way of taking the throne and he instead reconciles with Saul. God would give this robe to David. He would not have to rip it off of Saul. Verse 12. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee, as saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. So David calls on the Lord to judge between him and Saul, the first of two times in this exchange. Why does David call on the Lord? Why does David call on the Lord? He does so to imply to Saul that this evaluation by God would not go well for him. Saul, if God comes as judge, it will not be good for you. David will be vindicated. Again, David has resolved to not try and usurp the Lord's plans for his ascension to the throne. David would not take matters into his own hands. David would not slay the king as echoed in the ancient proverb that he quotes. But this is still a rebuke to Saul. He comes with a rebuke to the king. Saul had no business coming after David and God was witness to it all. God was witness to it all. Right? Any injustice committed against us, God is witness to it all. And God will bring vengeance. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea. The Lord that therefore be judge and judge between me and thee and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of thine hand. Now here, David is either making the point that he is insignificant, like a flea on a dead dog, or he is asking Saul if he knows who he's messing with. I tend towards the second of the two. If the former, if the first one, if David's just making a reference to how insignificant, why would you come after me? I'm nothing. Then David is simply pointing out, pointing to his small band in comparison to Saul's army and pointing of how little of a threat he poses, which I don't think David believes. He knows the throne's going to be his. So if it's the latter, if he's saying here that Saul does not know who he's messing with, then David is using these terms to say that he is not a joke. He's not a joke. He is not some dead dog or some flea on that dog. He is more than a pest to Saul. He is the Lord's anointed. And so what are you doing, Saul? What are you doing coming after the Lord's anointed? Why would you set yourself up like that? David knew he would inherit the throne of Israel. He knew that he was the Lord's anointed. The psalms he was writing through all his trials testify to this fact. Why would Saul set himself up against the Lord and his anointed? What good could come from such an aim? And how would Saul have victory in such an endeavor? And so David again turns to the Lord to be judge. He calls upon the Lord to be judge and to plead his cause, to deliver David out of Saul's hand. And what a comfort it is to have the Lord pleading your cause. What a comfort it must have been to David. David knows that if he has the Lord pleading his cause, then he will deliver him. He'll be delivered if the Lord is pleading his cause. And this is the glory of the gospel. We have Jesus as our high priest, pleading his shed blood for our sins. Poor guy. And as the children of God, we always have God pleading our cause. We always have God pleading our cause. Against all our enemies, we go in the name of Jehovah. He pleads our cause. And it came to pass when David made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I. For thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. Saul had deserved worse, but he received good from David. Although Saul, for a while, was on a mission to kill David, David spared Saul's life and showed him respect. This, although only temporary, we see, softens Saul's heart. Saul calls David his son, likely remembering much of their earlier relationship. 
Saul is humbled, and so he weeps in light of how he had been treating David over this season. Saul recognizes that some people are better than others. David was more righteous than him. This righteousness was seen by Saul in light of him receiving from David the opposite of what he was trying to give to David. He's trying to kill him, and he receives mercy from David's hand. And thou hast showed this day how that thou hast dwelt well with me. For as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good, for that thou hast done unto me this day. The robe is proof of David's kindness to Saul. And Saul is floored that David would not do what Saul himself would have done in that same scenario. The only reason Saul is even in this cave is that he is on a hunting trip for David's life. And here is David himself, sparing Saul, and then seeking reconciliation with him for cutting off a piece of his garment. Saul calls on the Lord, not that he has much say there, to bless David in light of his mercy towards Saul. Now Saul's heart towards David would not last. We know it wouldn't last, but David still receives this word from Saul. It could not be denied by Saul, and this is probably why he doesn't call for his men to come after David. How could he, at least in this moment, do harm to the man who had just spared his life? And now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, Saul says, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thy hand. So Saul acknowledges David's anointing unto kingship in Israel. David is holding a piece of Saul's robe. The kingdom was being given into David's hand. David was clearly God's man. Saul had been striving like crazy to eliminate David, and he can't get his hands on him. And Saul has been utterly humbled by God in being so fully handed over to David. Right, he can't get David, and now he gets put right into David's hand, and now David comes out to him. It could not be clear. God is for David. He is God's anointed, and God would, in due time, give him the throne of Israel. Our last two verses. Swear now, therefore, unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home. But David and his men got them up unto the hold. So Saul makes David promise not to cut off his seed, and David agrees. Much like David's covenant with Jonathan, David commits himself to the offspring of Saul. He commits to not wiping them out completely. Even when he would have the throne, David had promised to not wipe out Saul's lineage. Saul knew that if David was on the throne, if the throne was given to David, his line would only be preserved through David's mercy. If he wanted his line preserved, he would have to call out to David for mercy. Saul has David before him, but he doesn't take his life. He is, for the moment, humbled. He is, for the moment, humbled. Still, David was not about to return with Saul. Right, Saul, we read, goes to his home. David stays with his men back up into a hold. David was a wise man. He knew that Saul was still not to be trusted. Saul speaking lofty words to David. You're going to inherit the throne. You know, watch out for my family. Please don't wipe them out. But David knows he's not trustworthy. Saul's emotions had shown themselves fickle in the past, and David wasn't going to risk his life by following such a fickle man home. David, though giving in partially to the temptation to take the throne in his own timing, submits himself to God and to God's timing. God would give David the throne. David would be established in righteousness, but he would get there through suffering. He'd get there through this time in the wilderness, this time of suffering. David would serve as a type of Christ, one who would endure suffering and attain glory in accordance not with earthly wisdom, but with the perfect plan of God. Jesus did not take any shortcuts. He fulfilled all righteousness and he suffered under the wrath of God for sinners, for us. If he had sought another way, if Jesus had sought another way, then we would have no hope. We would have no hope. But because Jesus endured the cross, because he rose from the dead, we have a perfect and eternal hope. And only there. So trust God's timing 
Be anxious for nothing. Do not try to force God's hand into blessing. Don't try to jump the gun. Where God has promised, he will deliver. Where God has promised, he will deliver. That's our bedrock. He will make good on all of his promises. And they're all grace to us. If God has not promised something, then all the striving for it, in that regard, will be in vain. We have to take God at his word. We have to be content with his providences. Who are we to question his plans? Who are we to doubt his ways? What kind of life is that to live personally? What kind of example is that? Some, what kind of testimony is that to who God is? Is God not good? Does he not make good on all his promises? And so may our path be like David. May our consciences care about the law of the Lord in such a way that when we fail, we always turn back to him. When we fail, we repent and we continue to walk after the Lord, trusting his promises afresh, walking with zeal renewed. And amen. Let's pray. Father, this world is...